Hello again, everyone. Again, I'm Kathy Zip, Managing Editor of Solar Power World, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Creating Cost-Effective Solar Insulations with Aluminum Extrusion. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Aluminum Extruders Council for sponsoring this webinar. And before we begin, we'll go over just a few house cleaning items. I'd like to mention that this webinar will be available after the presentation on solarpowerworldonline.com, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. Secondly, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so we encourage you to participate. You may submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar by typing them into the GoToMeeting panel, which is located on your right. And lastly, we encourage everyone to tweet about key topics and discuss takeaways using the Twitter hashtag SolarWebinar. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Craig Warner. Craig is the chairman of the Aluminum Extruder Council Academy program. He is also president of Warner Extrusion Solutions, an extrusion design and process consulting firm where he assists extruder clients in process optimization and developing extrusion-based structures, particularly for the alternative energy industry. Craig has over 30 years of extrusion experience, having grown up in the industry as a member of Warner Company, a prominent ladder producer, and custom aluminum extruder. Craig holds a bachelor's degree in industrial and manufacturing systems engineering from Penn State and has a master's degree in industrial administration from Carnegie Mellon. So we are thrilled to have him here with us today. And Craig, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you very much, Kathy. Appreciate the introduction. Welcome to everyone. I also want to uh, note that we have some uh, Co-sponsors, Alexandria Industries and SAPA, which are both uh, long-term members of the Aluminum Extruders Council and very active. And uh, they'll be helping at the end of the presentation with the Q&A portion. So let's get started and learn a bit about aluminum extrusions, although I'm actually having problems advancing the slides here. Thank you. Uh, the first thing I'm going to need to ask you to advance it for me, if you go back one to the antitrust. Um, we're very pleased to be hosting this, this event, and uh, we're going to talk a about a lot of interesting information, but uh, there are going to be representatives from various competing companies as part of this. Uh, our goal is to enhance your general knowledge of extrusions, but uh, we also want to make sure that we stay very far away from any kind of state or federal antitrust issues. So there will at no time during this are we going to talk about pricing, markets, customers, territories, etc. cetera. Uh, any questions about this? Uh, you'd be able to contact any of the above mentioned companies. Next slide, please. Aluminum is a, a tremendous material. It has a lot of great characteristics that we're going to talk about. Uh, it's even more useful when you combine it with the aluminum extrusion process because between the material and the process you can create things that are really incredible. The amount of detail and the amount of functionality you can build into parts. And those, the functionality and the, the extrusions can be done very cost-effectively as well. Next, please. Next slide, please. With uh, aluminum extrusions, you can make very long shapes as well. So that gives you the um, that gives you the capability to be doing many different things like CSP and CPV, uh, building integrated portions, things for commercial utilities, residential, light commercial. Uh, you have the capabilities to build into aluminum extrusions, tolerancing and other features that are not only short in nature as you have with many machine shop applications, but you can have these tolerances and shapes in very, very long shapes. So next slide, please. The, um, the, the I'm sorry, I'm off one on the slide. There we go. Thank you very much. Besides being used for CSP, P, uh, CPV, and PC applications, uh, PV applications, it's also being extrusions are are being used more and more in uh, building integrated PV, and uh, these environments allow you to put in sunshades and other building components. So more and more, we're seeing things built 
locked into buildings, which is really going to be tremendous for the future. Next slide, please. When we go through the presentation, um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, thank you. We go through today's presentation. We're one slide ahead now. We should be on the introduction, uh, the agenda. We, uh, we're going to talk about the advantages of aluminum and aluminum extrusions, and we're also going to talk about the extrusion process to teach you a little bit about that. A lot of the conversation is going to deal with the practical uh, limitations of extrusions, alloys, functionality, some, some tips and tricks that can help you to make more cost-effective decisions in your designs. And finally, we're going to finish up with economics. So a, a little bit about aluminum. I mean, there's a lot of things listed here. Um, actually, you're one slide ahead of me again. But uh, aluminum extrusions have a very high strength to weight ratio. For solar applications, these are all important. Corrosion resistance, the ability to conduct and dissipate heat, particularly important for photovoltaic applications. They're electrically conductive, which as we know is very, very important for grounding. And they have extraordinary cold strength and of course are very recyclable. We'll talk quite a bit about that. Converted into the extrusion process, into aluminum extrusions, as I said, you can do complex integral shapes, very interesting shapes, and in very long lengths and close tolerances. The parts are easy to fabricate and join and uh, are very cost effective and can be prototyped very quicker, very quickly. The ability to put all these different features into one part and make the parts quickly and cost effectively means you can rapidly prototype things and really come up with ideal design solutions quickly. Next slide, please. Aluminum uh, weighs about the third as much as uh, steel or copper or brass. And because of this, uh, aluminum can minimize transportation costs. And if you look at uh, a, a traditional ground mount system, perhaps a one megawatt system, you can see that there's about a 22% reduction in the total cost um, or the total weight of the material used in the aluminum versus the steel framing system. The combination of aluminum's uh, lightweight with, with its very high strength to weight ratio is one of the reasons that it's used quite a bit in transportation industries. And uh, this is just a picture of the frame that's used in the new uh, Corvette. It's lighter, stiffer, and it creates a great car made in America. Next, please. Aluminum is corrosion resistant, different than, uh, than steel. Uh, we, sh we should be on... Okay, there we are. Thank you. Different than steel, uh, which when it when it oxidizes, the the uh, iron oxide actually spalls off, exposing new material underneath, which then it, they can then corrode. Steel needs to be protected to prevent this. Aluminum has a self-healing, self-protective uh, film that imme immediately forms over top of it, and even if that is scratched through, it's uh, able to be. It will automatically fix itself. So you don't have to do, for most applications, any kind of additional corrosion resistance with aluminum. In addition, aluminum has very great cold strength. The, uh, the different from steel and plastics, which tend to get brittle when the temperature drops, aluminum actually gets both stronger and tougher. Next slide, please. Aluminum is extremely electrically conductive, and uh, while it carries on a volume basis less electricity than copper, on an equal weight basis, it carries quite a bit more. It's twice as conductive as copper, and it often represents a very economical choice. Because of this electrical conductivity, it actually facilitates grounding uh, very well in solar applications. It conducts heat and dissipates heat very, very well, better than almost any other material on both a weight and cost basis. Because of this, again, it's ideally suited to photovoltaic applications where uh, the panels tend to work much better at lower temperatures than at higher temperatures. Next slide, please. Aluminum is fully recyclable. And in fact, uh, it's been in, in production since 19, or 1888. And over 75% of the aluminum that was produced since 1988 is actually still in productive use today. It looks different. It's been melted down, recast, and reformed, and put into sheet goods or aluminum extrusions or other products, but uh, it's still in use today. 
The beauty of the recycling process for aluminum is that it only takes 5% of the energy needed to make virgin aluminum as it takes to melt it down and reuse it again. Uh, extrusions often contain a lot of recycled content, somewhere between 50 and 80%. And uh, in fact, if you look at the industry in North America, in 2012, the North American industry used over a billion pounds of scrap in the production of its, its extruded parts. Next, please. Aluminum comes in a variety of different uh, alloy classes, and I'm not really going to go into a lot of detail on, the, on each of these, the, but the series, the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, et cetera, represent the major alloying ingredients that are used. For solar applications, the bulk of these will be in the 6,000 series alloys, which use magnesium and silicon as an alloying ingredient. And these can be produced with different uh, tempers, which can affect the performance of the material, both in terms of strength and also in terms of electrical conductivity and other, other characteristics. Next, please. I'd like to shift gears now and uh, talk a little bit about the aluminum extrusions, not just the aluminum material. As I mentioned previously, extrusions can be produced to close tolerances and have a lot of built-in features. So if you look at the, the photo on the left, you can see that there's a lot of very interesting features built into these two pieces that slide together. Now this is a quarter inch long piece, but in actuality, this part will be extruded out at somewhere between 120 and maybe 180 feet long and then cut into the lengths that are needed by the customer, or these two parts will be produced in that manner. So it'd be easy to picture making a machined part like this, but trying to make a part that long, extrusion is often the only way to do this. Now, you can make parts like this out of steel. Uh, often they're either roll formed or they're combined from uh, separate structural shapes. So for example, if you wanted to have a steel part that looked like this, if this was the final part you wanted, it would be much longer. I just didn't sketch it all the way out. It might be made up of uh, an L-shaped piece on the top, an I-beam in the center, and a square tube on the bottom with uh, four welds holding all the pieces together. Next, please. The extrusion version of this can actually be extruded all in one piece where the features that are desired, and in fact even more features, can be built right into the extrusion so that in, in, from billet to extrusion, as I'll show you later, this comes out all as one piece, doesn't require any subsequent work to get all these features built in. You can locally thicken areas for strength or for fastening purposes. You can build in screw bosses, which we'll discuss later. And you can put in different types of features, perhaps to stiffen up the ends of, uh, of little legs like this. So terrific ability to put in shape that would be difficult to do otherwise, and all in one pass, not welding together other pieces. Next, please. Extrusions um, can take a wide range of finishes. They can be painted, either powder-coated or liquid, and they can be anodized. And uh, these are terrific things, and they can make beautiful finishes that match many, many different other architectural features that somebody may desire. Often in solar, these, uh, this protection isn't needed because of the self-healing um, aluminum oxide skin that forms on any kind of aluminum, but also aluminum extrusions. While you can anodize or paint, to meet the aesthetics or other requirements that might, they, there might be, you don't often have to, which can save perhaps 15 or 20 percent of the cost of an extrusion. So uh, you should carefully consider whether or not uh, anodizing or painting are really needed. Aluminum is easy to fabricate, and it can be fabricated, bent, machined, cut, finished, etc., in many, many different ways. And I'm sure many of you have seen applications of aluminum extrusions around the world. Next, please. This next slide shows a, a simple extrusion that's just demonstrating a number of different features that can be easily built into extrusions. Everything from interesting surface finishes to a hinge joint. This is actually a two-part extrusion where this bottom part of the C-shaped part is one extrusion and this top panel is another. It hinges about here and snap fits together. Built into this extrusion are heat sinks and all kinds of other features connection features, places to put a slot with a, for a T-nut or a regular hex nut, uh, and other features. Easy, easy to build things in. Often it's just a matter of the designer knowing what they're trying to accomplish. Because of the lightweight strength and all these features that you can build in, it's often easy to, to make things that are very, very easy to assemble with aluminum extrusions. And a photo of uh, the Statue of Liberty here uh, actually shows this. I wouldn't want to be standing up that high, a long way up in the air, but this uh, the renovation of the Statue of Liberty was accomplished with uh, aluminum extruded scaffolding that went all around it. 
did a terrific job, safe, easy to install, lightweight, and when they were all done, they were able to recycle it. Next, please. Um, extrusions are very cost effective. So different from some of the other processes, and cooling costs are very low on extrusions. And uh, besides the cost of extrusion tooling, which could be for most shapes somewhere between $500 and $5,000 compared to the other processes shown above it, the lead times are very, very quick to get extrusion tooling done. Not, now, two weeks is, is possible to get a part out. Not everyone can do that, but in an emergency, you can get it quickly. Two, three, four weeks is simple for most extruders to be able to accomplish once they know the parameters of the part. And if you look at some of the other production uh, means, you can see that um, it takes a lot longer for those. Because of the low cost and the quick prototyping, you actually can sequentially prototype things in a manner to develop products more cost effectively using aluminum extrusions. Next, please. So let's talk about the extrusion process. It's actually uh, conceptually a simple process. If you picture a tube of toothpaste or a Play-Doh machine, you'll see in a minute, it's basically taking an aluminum billet, which is the feedstock. It's heated up, and it's actually inside a container, which you can't see because you wouldn't be able to see the billet, but it goes around the billet. And then from the back, the aluminum extrusion press pushes the billet through a steel die and the die has a backer on it, but then out from the other side, in, the, in this example, we can see two extrusions being made with a lot of features already built in, depending on what the die had built into it. So this is, uh, this is sequentially what happens from extruding a billet to get the final parts out. Next, please. A little, looking at it a little bit more simplistically, the same thing happens with Play-Doh. But this Play-Doh one is particularly interesting because it shows you how you make the hollow tube. You know, one would look at this Play-Doh die, and you would think that when you push Play-Doh through here, you would get one U-shaped piece on the top and a matching U-shaped piece on the bottom, and never the twain shall meet. But in fact, it takes so much pressure, even in this limited Play-Doh example, that the metal welds back together once it splits by these two little plastic pieces here. It comes back together into a solid tube. In the aluminum extrusion process, the... the, the uh, mechanism is very, very similar, although there's even more of a mixing chamber area after the metal separates before it comes together in this annular slot to create the shape. So while you don't get a true seamless weld, it is nearly a seamless weld, and extensive testing is done uh, on all of this production, doing flare tests and other things to be sure that there's not failures along the weld. So extrusions make hollows all the time not for high pressure applications, but for structural applications are absolutely superb. Next, please. The extrusion tooling to make a hollow die, um, this is actually a few different tools stacked together, but for example, this, tube, this piece of tooling here and this tier, this part goes right inside this ring, and the billet comes from the back side is extruded into these five rungs. These are actually the D rungs that go on an extension ladder. This little brown piece forms the ID inside diameter of the rung, and this brown piece here creates the outside diameter. You can probably just pick up some of the uh, nibs that are on there for friction. So that's uh, this one push would come out and make five holes. In this case, I, I happened to run this die in my Chicago operation at one time. They would run out to about 120 feet long and then be cut into use for ladders. Next, please. The aluminum extrusion press is uh, buried back here where we can't see it, but these are uh, very, very high pressure and uh, rigorous pieces of equipment. Most presses, let's say a typical press, might be in the three to, to uh, 5,000 pound tonnage range, which means that it's somewhere between uh, six and 10 million pounds of force that it's pushing out. And when it pushes the billet and it puts it through the die, in this case, we're getting three holes extruding out at the same time. It's a three hole die. and Coincidentally, each of those holes happens to have three hollows in it, but you can see they extrude out the very, very long lengths, and then they're cut to size and uh, stretched, sawn, and then aged. Next, please. The long length extrusions are, uh, go through a stretching process where they are, uh, can not quite see it in this photo, but it's right here. They, they're stretched and then batched into batches. The stretching is a very minor percent of stretch just to beyond the yield point to get it perfectly straight. And then the extrusions come into a finish saw, 
where they're cut up to the final length. This could be anywhere from four to maybe 30 or 40 feet long, and uh, depending on what the product requires. It, often, if you're going to cut extrusions into much smaller pieces, the final cut isn't done on the saw. It's done on a subsequent piece of fabrication equipment. But for, you know, four, five, six foot up to whatever length you want them cut, it's done right off the saw. These parts are then put into an aging rack and put up, put into uh, an aging rack to be heat treated. Next, please. I'd like to move off the extrusion process now and move on to uh, a little bit more of the entire process of making a part. So extrusions can be extruded and then aged to strengthen them and create other characteristics in the material. They can also be painted, as I noted, wet or powder, um, anodized, polished, bright dipped, mechanically finished, silk screened, and from there, all kinds of fabrication, anything from bending and welding and machining and sawing can be done to those parts. This is kind of an interesting progression on the bottom here. It shows the extruded part going through a punching operation to notch off and create the rounded corners, incorporating also another piece which was put on top to weld it. Then there's some coating done to it and finally make the final part out of it. So this is showing how a simple extrusion can become a functional part pretty effectively. Next, please. I'm going to go back to the coating process. You know, there is some reasons why you would coat aluminum or aluminum extrusions, and that's uh, mostly for aesthetics, to match colors or for other aesthetic reasons, and either anodizing or painting can do that very, very effectively. Uh, but there's often not a reason to do that in many solar applications, unless it's something you're going to see. If you need a, a black, black framework on top of a black roof on a house, certainly you're not going to want a shiny aluminum piece up there in a residential neighborhood. But if you're going to be on top of something in a commercial establishment where no one can see it except if you're in a plane, there may not be a reason to have any color. Protection-wise, the only reason to protect the extrusion is if it's subject to very, very high uh, corrosive environment, acid rains, other pollutants, some salt spray. Uh, often, it's not needed. So again, I'd encourage you when you design your parts to think about whether you really need to include any kind of coating. Well, you'd certainly need it in steel, but you don't really need it in extrusions. Next, please. Um, I, we can skip over this. This is just showing. Uh, painting and anodizing, have some of the things batched up and ready to go into it. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Um, OK, we're on. I can see the painting and anodizing. If you'd go just one more, please. No. I'm sorry, but you on my screen you jumped two two more. If we could go back to the one that shows extrusions with outstanding design flexibility, there we go. Thank you very much. The uh, aluminum extrusions, as I keep saying, they're able to build in a lot of interesting features, and you know there's some heat sinks and other things shown on here. But there are some limitations. Limitations on aluminum extrusions can can uh, be tied to the circle size. So the circle size is the largest circumscribing, sorry, the smallest circumcising circle that can go around a part. So for this little part, which is probably you know a four-inch circle size, whereas this part, which is highlighted in yellow, takes almost a 13-inch circle size. Well, there's a lot of presses that can do smaller parts, but not as many that can do larger. We'll see that in a minute. So circle size is a consideration. How heavy or light the shape is is a little bit of a consideration. And then there's a few other things I'll be talking about in the tips and tricks on tongue ratios and uh, the way that the, the part is configured, which uh, can help you to design extrusions that are uh, easier to extrude and therefore less expensive. Next, please. This chart um, is available on the AEC website. And it, uh, it provides a very quick look at uh, kind of the presses, the sizes of shapes that are widely available. Those are the green Ws, all the way to the ones uh, with the Xs, which may be very difficult to find anybody to make. So we can look at parts that are somewhere between you know, less than an inch up to perhaps a 10-inch circle size. Those presses are widely available. And the corresponding cross-sectional area and the corresponding profile weight that goes along with it um, you can kind of see you can't make really, really, really tiny shapes. There's some people that can make them, but not a lot. As soon as you get up to, you know, uh, point oh, well, let's go to the weight per foot. Um, six tenths of a pound a foot up to, or sorry, six hundredths up to 
6.12 pounds a foot, there's some available. When you get up into the higher ranges and the medium ranges, there's lots of presses available to do this. So uh, where, where limitations start to show up is when you're trying to do parts that are greater than 14 inches in diameter. There are certainly presses available to do that, but they're fewer, and uh, they're not located in every part of the country. So a lot of times uh, the designer can do themselves um, a lot of help if they just look at the part and try to come up with ways to keep the circle size down a little. You can do bigger circle sizes, but uh, sometimes clever designers can come up with ways to limit the circle size. Next, please. Extrusions can be, be produced in various alloys, and these are just some of the 6,000 alloys, 6,000 series alloys, and just a small sampling of them. Um, the alloys um, can range from the lower strength 6060 and 6063 up through the medium strength 6005As and 6061s to the higher strength 6082s. And it's really a, uh, it's a question of the amount of silicon and magnesium in the product and uh, also the way the other alloy ingredients are designed. And I'm not going to go into a ton of information on that. But I would like to pop on to the next slide because I think it shows something pretty interesting. A lot of times uh, people specify a particular alloy, like 6061, because it's been in use for many, many years. It's a fine alloy. It's used for many structural applications. But uh, it's not the only alloy that's available. Uh, that alloy has been in use for, I think, over 50 years. Newer alloys like 6005A are available. And they actually provide, and you can go back and reference this chart later, they provide equivalent strength and equivalent other features, sometimes even a little bit better in electrical conductivity and things, uh, at a lower cost. And uh, the, the alloy um, is a good, good substitution for 6061 in many, many cases. So I'd encourage those designing with extrusions not to be fixated on any one alloy, 61 for example. And in fact, even some of the lower strength alloys are perfectly appropriate for many of the parts used in solar applications. If it requires high strength, well, you probably want to look to the 6005As or 6061. But sometimes uh, lower strength is all that's required. You just need basic support, and that could be done by these alloys, which are much easier to extrude and can take on improvements in other areas. Next, please. I'm focusing in on this 6061 because I hear this question asked all the time about alloys. People will call me up or contact me through the AEC. And um, this, this, I'm not selling 6005A here as the only alloy. This is meant to be illustrative. But 6005A offers the same strengths and the same mechanical features, but it's got much better consistency and uh, much lower quench sensitivity. And as you can see, it's also better in terms of corrosion resistance and toughness. So for an application like this, if you're making a part like this out of 6061, you'd have to quench it pretty heavily. And that might cause some distortion on some of the thinner legs that are, that are outside of the part. Also, it's, you can't get water to the inside of this long extrusion. Because of that, uh, 6005A, you can often go with a much lighter quench and come out with a part that stays straighter, less twist and bow, and gives you all the performance that you required out of the 6061. Next, please. When talking about aluminum extrusions with extruders, you'll, you'll see that they talk about three different categories of extrusions, solid, solids, and semi-hollows. In the hollows, they'll talk about different classes from the simple balanced ones to a little bit more complex and even more complex extrusions. The semi-hollow one is one that I want to talk about because at first glance, somebody might look at that and say, well, that's just another solid. But the semi-hollow refers to the fact that some of these near voids, they're not all the way hollows, but the way the die has to be manufactured to make the shape is somewhere between what a solid looks like and a hollow looks like. They tend to be a little bit more expensive. So sometimes some very minor changes in the way, it, and I'll show you this later, but minor changes in the way a die design will occur can save you a lot of money on tooling. Uh, next, please. And actually, the portion I want to talk about now is some of these things, some of the design practices. And uh, if you're going to take nothing away from this presentation other than this, if you're working on new designs, kind of glance through some of these ideas and uh, try to build some of it into it. I, I want to be clear, though. You know, a lot of these say, not this, but this. But in fact, you can easily extrude this part. It's just that this part extrudes better. So if you don't need, and people that are used to dealing with steel and roll form products, things like that, they may say, oh, I have to have the same wall thickness. I need to thick your hair, so I'll double it up. And they might design an extrusion that looks just like that. But in fact, if all they need is a certain gap, 
and maybe the outside surfaces, they can make a part with uniform walls, which saves metal, therefore costs less, and also produces better. It's a little bit faster to extrude, which also saves cost. So when you can do it, do this. Uniformity is clear here, too. You've got kind of cons more consistent walls on this heat sink here with double void hollow. Here you have a very, very thin internal wall. Somebody may have designed that thinking, I don't need the strength, so I'll save myself a little bit of metal and go with a skinny wall. You don't have to do that. If you can make it a little bit thicker, it'll extrude better. I'm not going to go through every detail on all these, but generally smoother transitions, rounder, smoothed out things are better than any time you have a sharp corner. It'll extrude better. Symmetrical shapes extrude better than non-symmetrical shapes. Sometimes when you run an extrusion, you get some temperature-related marks on them. They're not, uh, they're just visual anomalies or no kind of defect. It just shows up different sometimes in finishing or after, after it's cooled down. And you can often mask those with some very simple uh, stripes or other things on the extrusion, little nibs. Next, please. The next several slides are just showing more examples of uh, some clever things. While it's certainly possible to extrude a part like this, and many people might do it, if you don't need these two big solos, solids, you can save yourself a lot of metal um, by making it configured like the part on the left, and also make it more extrudable. Next, please. Uh, this is the uh, part that I was referring to with the semi-hollow and the tongue ratio. The, uh, it'll, it should show up on your screen in a moment. Um, can we get to the one that shows um, one more slide, please? There we go. I think that's it. So a part like this would have a very, very narrow slot here. And this would be deemed a semi-hollow because of the tooling design that's required here. And while this can certainly be produced, the, it'll limit the amount of extrusion speed, and there may be some die breakage and some cost associated with that. A simple design change to put this little leg in here that bows out a little bit. You can see the part's identical other than that. That, make, that goes from a maybe challenging part to extrude, certainly not impossible, to a very simple part to extrude, just with this minor little dog legs here and back. So what I'd encourage any designer to do is don't try to come to the end of your design process without talking to extruders. Talk to local extruders. Talk to your suppliers that are already making extrusions for you. Get them involved in the design process early. Next, please. Uh, this is just another way to deal with these uh, deep and narrow tongues. Um, you can build things in that uh, require that are first extruded, opened up, and then can be bent to shape, or can have a removable part that's then either roll formed or punched out to create the shape. Next, please. Some of the features that are also often built into aluminum extrusions are screw bosses. And uh, these screw bosses allow you to put perhaps end plates onto an extrusion. And basically, you use self-tapping screws to go into them. Often, people who haven't been involved with extrusion before, if they want to build a feature like that, they'll usually think of something that's a simple hollow, thinking that it'll be easier because it's round and they can just somebody can extrude it out. And it's, again, certainly possible to extrude a shape like this with these two hollows. But it's a whole lot easier to make it as a solid die and a whole bunch less expensive. You know, this this die might cost you know five or six hundred dollars, and this this die might cost two or three thousand dollars. So it's often better to do screw bosses as open shapes where you can. Next, please. Uh, th I actually love these couple of things because it shows you that people it's people that are experienced with extrusions can often take a shape that's very possible to extrude against sharp corners, which didn't have those. But this shape has three hollows, one, two, three. This shape can be made into um, a hollow with a little bit of a semi-hollow portion onto it here, which is much easier to extrude and a little bit less expensive. And if, if structurally this works, it's a better design feature. This one's even a nicer thing. The design on the right here shows a two-void hollow, which is certainly doable with a screw boss built into it. But if that screw boss can be moved onto the sidewall of the other portion here, you, you turn this into a single hollow, which is less expensive and will extrude even better. Next, please. While solids are, uh, are easy to extrude and uh, can be uh, 
produced very efficiently. We make a lot of extruded hollow shapes in, the, in our business. And a lot of times it's because hollows can actually be more stable than a solid, whether in a solar application when you're using struts and other long members where compressive buckling may be a failure mechanism for the design. Uh, hollows tend to perform in any material, whether it's aluminum, steel, vinyl, whatever. It always perform better as a hollow than a solid. And it can actually strengthen it. Here's one example of that. Next, please. Sometimes when you design hollows, though, depending on the application, if you don't need the parts to be physically joined together for strength reasons, but you're trying to create some other feature, sometimes you can make the hollow as two separate parts rather than one hollow with a lot of complicated other little hollows within it. Next, please. This is an actual uh, extruded rail for a PV roof mount. And it shows some really interesting things built into it. It has uh, the nut channel up, up top for putting a T-nut or a regular hex nugget into it. It's got screw bosses built into it to put end plates onto it. Uh, this is used for, a, uh, as I said, a PV roof mount part. It's got the wireway already built into it. So rather than having to add something on to perhaps a steel structural member, the wireway is built in. It's got the perforations already built into it so that you can assemble it easy and allow for drainage. And what's interesting about this part is it, it shows many of the things I've discussed so far. You can build in the functionality. You can uh, take advantage of some of the design tips, whether it's the use of screw bosses or nice rounded corners. And uh, you can design a structure that exactly meets the features and the functions that you want it to do. Making it this out of steel would require somebody to take a limited number of available steel shapes and either roll form parts or take shapes and connect them together, welding them, and then you'd have to galvanize them and everything else. In aluminum extrusion, you can put all this functionality in and build it right from the onset in one die that extrudes out all the functionality you need. Next, please. Those uh, designers who uh, are going to get involved in the aluminum extrusion design process will surely want to pick up a copy of the aluminum design manual, which is available from the Aluminum Association. You can refer back to this uh, later. The presentation will be online. But this design manual gives you a lot of information that you need in order to know how to design parts out of aluminum extrusions and actually other, material, other things out of aluminum. Next, please. Uh, this is a simple example of the type of thing that would be covered in the design manual and the type of design considerations that go on when you're actually producing an aluminum part. This would be a, a fictitious ground mount system. They don't really use these slanted back legs that are shown here. But we were using this as an example to show that if you did have snow and wind loads coming on and dead loads and you were trying to make this part out of aluminum, in the design manual for steel, you know, and a lot of the software jumps right up and might tell you what to do. And it's pretty easy to do in aluminum. You're just trying to solve for the diameter and the wall thickness. Next, please. And, and going through the extrusion design manual, it will guide you through the, the design process in a very similar fashion if you went through the steel design manual. Uh, there we go. And it will lead you to the optimal solution, which is a diameter of 2 and 3 quarter, 2 and 3 eighths inches and a thickness of 0.625. Uh, next slide, please. So when, when you pick up a copy of this, you'll find that the aluminum design manual is certainly a different color than the steel construction manual. But the, the way that the manual is laid out and the information contained in it um, very closely mirror that of the steel manual. So those that are familiar with designing steel products will be able to use a design manual for their own use and extrusions very well. Next, please. The, the last thing I'd like to talk before we can talk about before we conclude is kind of the economics behind aluminum and steel. People often think that uh, aluminum is simply more expensive than steel. Uh, should be one more slide ahead of here, please. Aluminum actually is uh, quite a bit more expensive on a dollar per pound basis, but on a I'm sorry, I'm still on there. There we go. Thank you. But on, uh, when, you, when you look at the fact that aluminum's density is much lower than steel, we should be back on the page, prior page to this. When you look at the fact that the aluminum has a much lower density than steel, and you figure in the ways that extrusions can be designed to build in features and to reduce the total cost of manufacturing, including fabrication and assembly, how much lighter they are, then you look at all the transportation costs, you look at the fact that one guy can generally pick up an extrusion and assemble it. 
All these costs together often end up with extrusions being a better solution. Next slide, please. IBIS is a group of uh, professionals that came out of MIT and they do uh, strategic material selection uh, decision support for companies. And they ran a study on aluminum versus steel for photovoltaic applications from uh, commercial flat roof through a small ground mount, medium ground mount, and large uh, ground mount utility systems. And uh, in fact, the aluminum, which is the left bar in each of these, the total installed cost of aluminum was always less than the steel counterpart. So whether it was commercial flat top or small, medium, or large ground mount, aluminum, when you look at the total cost of material, any of the other parts that go into it, the contractor and distribution cost, labor for installation and shipping, when you look at all those together, aluminum is the better solution. And by the way, when this part someday is, uh, you know, when the PV panels need to be replaced and maybe these parts are recycled, aluminum has three times the recycled value as uh, steel components. Next, please. The same group, IBIS, did a uh, study um, on CSP, concentrated solar power, parabolic troughs. And they looked at the uh, steel troughs. They looked at several different steel designs. And they looked at the uh, aluminum design done at Nevada Solar One or a system similar to it. And uh, they found that, uh, first of all, the Nevada Solar One, the, the aluminum design, can actually have uh, far fewer parts. And it's much easier to assemble. It's simple pinned interference pins were used to connect it versus a complex uh, jig system that is then welded. Next, please. And uh, they also found that there's a substantial cost difference, not in the material, because if you look only at the primary material, actually there's some of the steel frames on a per unit basis, so the amount of area of mirror that's supported. This steel Eurotrough system is actually less than the aluminum system. But when you couple in the uh, galvanizing cost and the shipping and, and subassembly and all the other things that it takes to actually build this final facility, the aluminum collector was uh, a far better choice than using any of the available steel systems. Next, please. Because the prices of steel and aluminum and zinc vary over time, um, this we, we, we were interested to see that when they looked back over a 20-year period, there was really no time over that 20 years, despite aluminum being up and down in price compared to steel, where the aluminum system, this bottom dark blue line, was ever more expensive than the steel system shown above. So that was pretty interesting. That's a 20-year time span, and it shows even as commodity prices change, aluminum remains the ideal solution. Next, please. Additional resources uh, are certainly available from the aluminum design manual. And actually, the ASE, American Society of Civil Engineers, puts on an excellent uh, online course, or they also have some, they'll come to your site if you need it, uh, which is uh, basically teaching engineers how to use the design manual, teaching them the critical things to think about when designing from extrusions. So if you are interested in uh, working with extrusions in your design, this is a good resource, and a good training resource if you need that. Next, please. Additional resources are certainly available from, the, from our sponsor, the Aluminum Extrusion uh, Council's website and from other materials they have. Uh, these materials are free. You can click on go on the website and you can uh, do a couple interesting things. First of all, you can find an extruder and I've worked a number of the solar shows uh, helping the AC by doing volunteer work. And when I show people the buyer's guide, which is, this is the online equivalent, find an extruder, they're often very interested because it shows them all the different extruders, what their capabilities are. And it's useful for them to know uh, people in their area that might be doing extrusion that they can stop in and talk to about their design concepts. So definitely download a copy of that. And also the aluminum extrusion manual is available, uh, which gives some of the tips and tricks and other things that uh, may be helpful for you when you're thinking about aluminum extrusions. Next, please. So uh, I'd like to conclude uh, the presentation portion of this just saying that aluminum extrusions are a great resource for many designs and certainly in the solar industry. They're well used in solar, but there's still a lot of steel framing systems out there that probably would be better suited to be made out of aluminum. And uh, I'd encourage you to work with your local extruders, work with your design community to try to come up with uh, innovative and cost-effective aluminum extruded solutions. These things are lightweight, strong, corrosion resistant, fully recyclable, a true sustainable material for the, for the renewable energy space. Uh, 
The last thing here is important, I've said it a few times, get your aluminum extrusion experts involved early so they can help you optimize your design choices to make sure that you get things can be quickly and as cost effectively as possible, taking full advantage of the many opportunities that designing with extrusions affords. Um, that is actually the end of uh, the formal presentation. I'd like to uh, open the floor up to Q&A, and I'm going to be getting some help um, from uh, Alexandria Industries and SAPA. I believe uh, Mark Turley will be on the phone from uh, Alexandria, and Scott Condry is on the phone from uh, SAPA. So if we could get them on, and uh, hopefully we've had some great yes. questions come our way. Yes, thank you very much, Craig. Very interesting presentation. And yes, I'm sure after all the information, the audience has some questions here, so we'll begin asking those. Remember that you can submit your questions at any time in your GoToMeeting panel on your right. Um, and Craig, I'll give you a break here. We'll go to Scott. Um, Scott, uh, someone is asking that you seem to be saying that pinging or um, is, is generally not needed. Can you say more about when additional finishing is called for? Yeah, there's certain applications that would demand some corrosion, additional corrosion protection. Uh, sometimes those may be in relatively high airborne salt areas uh, so that we can avoid any electrolytic corrosion that could happen with the salt mixing. Um, so that, that's why I would say the salt would, excuse me, the paint would be advised in some of those applications. Uh, knowing where the service life is going to be is paramount to making sure the right finishes are recommended. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I have a question here from Mark at Alexandria. Um, someone's asking, they're saying they're working with TV systems. Which alloy would you recommend and why? Um, the two alloys of choice, and I think Craig touched on it very well, are 6005 and 6063. Depending on structural requirements, um, those are the two alloys that the extruders like to use the most, 63 being slightly less structural and 6005 being used in a more structural application. So those are the two alloys of choice. All right. We'll uh, go back to Mark here for a second. Uh, standard tolerances are generally too loose for our needs, one person is asking. Uh, they said they find wide differences in the willingness of extruders to commit to tighter tolerances. They're wondering why this is and what is achievable. Yeah, for the most part, um, you know, standard tolerances are recognized throughout the extrusion world as the guideline. There are presses throughout the country and throughout the various extruders that can do half standard tolerances and it really depends on the intricacy of the shape and the design, the press that's going to be used and, and a few other uh, categories of, of reasons and why standard tolerances only could apply. So it really depends uh, a lot on the extruder, the press and the design whether they can tighten the tolerances or not. For the most part, a lot can be tightened and, and I've noticed in the PV world that's required quite a bit. So it's not extremely difficult to go through that process, but again, contacting um, your extruders early in the game and reviewing the, de the design and the, and the tolerance requirements is paramount. All right, we'll have one more here for uh, Scott at SAPA before turning back to Craig. Um, Scott, someone is saying I like the potential of sequential prototyping. Can you say more about turn around times and cost? Yeah, in general terms, um, when, when somebody says how much does it cost, I always say, well, how much does a car cost? Uh, you know, you get a car from 15000 to several hundred thousand dollars. So to narrow that down, let's talk about things that fit inside of an eight inch circle size, which would be on a prominently a 10 inch press. Uh, typically you'll see turnarounds on first articles on those for solid profiles in about two to four weeks and typically add one more week if it's a hollow profile. If it's a, a real complex geometry there may be a, an additional week or so added on there. But tooling for those types of dies for solid shape that fits inside of an eight inch circle size is going to be about 
fourteen to seventeen hundred dollars. And uh, for hollow profiles, you would see that go from about two thousand to perhaps three thousand dollars. And again, that's kind of a, a vague question. Uh, so I use the car analogy on that, but I think that probably gets it pointed in the right direction. I think so. Thank you, Scott. Um, and then we'll go back to Craig here. Craig, what is what are the biggest issues in converting steel based steel based designs to aluminum? You know, the biggest issue I see is that a lot of people don't have a lot of experience designing with extrusions and really knowing much about the extrusion process. Sometimes when I when I uh, talk to people, they've never really heard of it. And certainly PV use, they're, they're used broadly throughout PV, so I don't think that's uh, that's true in a lot of the solar markets. But engineers don't get a lot of training in aluminum extrusions. Uh, my family business was Warner Ladders, and uh, you know we ended up with 10 extrusion presses. I knew I wanted to learn a lot about extrusion. I had a hard time finding something at Penn State uh, to, to teach me about aluminum extrusions. I had to do a lot of independent study work through information that my, uh, my relatives gave to me. So the first thing is, is ed basic education. And the second thing is really probably breaking the mindset of working with standard parts where you're thinking of looking at a limited variety of standard parts that you have to somehow combine into the features you want. Or perhaps looking at a roll formed part where you have one gauge of material that you can fold back onto itself to double it, but you don't have any choices in between. It's looking from that perspective and switching mindset to the extrusion world where literally an infinite number of shapes are possible for, for very little uh, very little money in tooling. And it's really better to use often a custom shape than a standard shape. In steel, it's often it's many times the opposite. You're stuck using standard shapes. So I think it's a question of education and mindset, just the experience that people have or don't have with the limit extrusions. All right. Thank you, Craig. We have another question uh, for Scott at SAPA. Uh, someone's asking if you can explain more about how to create symmetrical snap together parts. Um, to create snap together parts, typically we want to understand if this is going to be something that's going to be serviced, in other words, snapped on and off some number of times, or if it's just going to be snapped once during the installation process, because the geometry of the snap details itself uh, would be would be a little bit different for a serviceable or non-serviceable fit. Um, boy, to answer that, I, I'd kind of like to see a sketch of, of the basic geometry of the part. But I would say this. Uh, one thing that is very, very important when we're talking about snap together parts is that it's clearly indicated to the extruder that the parts do mate together. Understand that a typical extrusion facility does more than 10,000 different custom profiles, and they don't always know that the parts mate together. And this kind of correlates to the other question regarding tolerances. Uh, if metal is within tolerance, but it doesn't snap together properly, the end user really tends to not be as concerned with the dimensions as they are the fit, form, and function. So with regards to the snap that I would encourage any listeners to please indicate on their drawings always which parts mate with the others. As far as the actual symmetrical snap, there's numerous different types of designs. Uh, there's different design manuals that can show some of these design inspirations for the types of snap. And I would encourage you to get a hold of me uh, for some very specific information regarding that, those kinds of details. Hi, thank you, Scott. Uh, I think we have time for one more question here, and this one is going to go to Mark. Um, Mark, what if I want an existing extrusion for my project? Okay, um, most extruders have a series of uh, angles, bars, rods, uh, hollows, uh, tubes, pipe that are standard shapes, and they can be used interchangeably from customer to customer. Most of the other shapes that extruders manufacture are custom to customer specific. So it is difficult to say that there will be a custom shape that's out there available. Although that's not 100%, there are some extruders that have open shapes that they extrude for different uh, uses and 
from different customers. So again, uh, my, my advice there would be to contact your extruder that you're going to be using, show them the shape that you want, find out if there is anything available that would be acceptable to be used, and if not, then you're going down the route of a custom design. Thank you, Mark. I think that's all we have time for today. Remember that you can contact Craig, Mark, or Scott um, if you have any additional questions with the information displayed on your screen there. I would like to thank uh, Craig and Mark and Scott for being here with us today. It's excellent presentation and great information. And I would also like to thank everyone in our audience for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned something. And please join us for other upcoming Solar Power World webinars. There's lots more to learn. Thank you all so much.